So uh, welcome everyone. I actually encourage you to take a seat at the, the main table, please, so that you can participate in the conversation if you would like. And uh, I, my name is uh, Ronaldo Lemos. I am a visiting researcher at uh, CIPA at the moment. And I'm very pleased today, I'm going to work as a sort of a moderator for our conversation, but to be hosting uh, some people that have been working and thinking about the state of freedom of speech, disinformation, and the public sphere in Brazil. I think this is a topic of interest, especially this year, because we are going to have an important election cycle in Brazil. Not only that, uh, this event is very timely because the Brazilian Congress is discussing right now a draft bill to deal precisely with uh, what it's called fake news or disinformation. And I'm sure there will be people watching what we are going to be talking here today. So it couldn't be more timely than that. And just for the sake of a brief introduction, I'm very happy to be uh, having this conversation with Patricia Campos Mello. Patricia is a visiting scholar here at CIPA as well. And she is a journalist and editor at large uh, with Folha de São Paulo, Brazil's main newspaper. And uh, Patricia is also a recipient of so many prizes, difficult to, to describe uh, all of them. But important for our conversation is uh, she was probably the pioneer in investigating disinformation standards and uh, practices uh, in Brazil. And uh, her articles, had a profound impact in Brazil in regards to the disinformation campaigns that were in place in 2018 during the election cycle. So thank you so much for being here with us, Patricia. Uh, we're also going to be talking with João Paulo Cuenca. Cuenca is a, an Argentinian Brazilian uh, writer. He has uh, eight books, if I'm not mistaken, translated also in eight languages, which I think it's remarkable for a Portuguese uh, writer, like for someone that writes in Portuguese. And Cuenca is also uh, a public intellectual in Brazil. He participates in the public debate and he has an interesting story of being sued 100 times in a coordinated effort, which 143 appears. Times. 143 times, sorry for that, <laughs> uh, because of one tweet. So I think you're going to basically talk a little bit about of that and also about what you're, how you're seeing the public sphere in Brazil and your own work. And we are also fortunate here to have uh, Roberto Martini. Martini is the founder of Flag CX, probably one of Brazil's most interesting and innovative communication, branding, innovation groups in the country. It's a group of companies and Martini has been involved in giving uh, basically consultancy to brands and uh, entities in Brazil and elsewhere in the world. And uh, he has a, a, an interesting uh, avant-garde, I would say, or forward-looking view about also uh, the public sphere in the country. So we have multiple perspectives here. And as for me, I'm just a lawyer. So uh, <laughs> that's my background. And uh, I've been working with these issues uh, of technology policy and also freedom of speech for uh, I think around like 20 years right now. So uh, I'll be happy also to discuss and I will work more as a facilitator and I'll give like a, maybe a couple of comments as we go around. So please feel free to join the conversation anytime. So please do interrupt us with comments, suggestions, questions. We have some amazing people in the room. So please don't let us be speaking alone here, like a please do participate in the conversation. With that said, let me give you the floor, uh, Patricia. Yes, to, to start. start no, well, let's start with you. <laughs> and like, uh, you, so you can tell us a little bit of how you're seeing this issue. So please. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to apologize. I have a bad cold, if not COVID. I've tested five times. <laughs> but I'm going to be coughing a bit, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, well, as Ronaldo was saying, after his extremely generous introduction, um, right now in Brazil and in many other countries, we are living the worst of uh, both worlds, so to say. 
uh, on the one hand, we have a new kind of censorship, which is the censorship by noise, which is basically the weaponization mm -hmm. of this information to drown out the investigative reporting, opposition voices, you name it. And at the same time, we still have the classic censorship, which is what Cuenca is living, which is what we um, investigative journalists are also living with um, judicial harassment. Uh, and since you mentioned, uh, we have um, in Brazil and of course here, as you may know, uh, populist politicians who have mastered uh, disinformation campaigns to mold narratives and to control the public debate. Uh, and uh, right now in Brazil, uh, they are discussing and they are most probably going to approve a bill that is called the fake news bill, which basically I mean, has several uh, aspects of it. But one of the aspects is very similar to a bill that was enacted by the governor of Florida uh, that basically gives immunity to politicians. To there in Florida was to candidates as well. But here, justice uh, struck down the law. And, and in Brazil, it's probably going to make it and, and become legislation, uh, basically giving a free pass to any politician who wants to spread this information and basically um glorify violence uh, what we are living in brazil right now we have it's just it's even ridiculous how mm -hmm. similar it is to the big lie you guys lived here in 2020 it's just uh, uh, the exact copy uh, of you know telling beforehand that mm -hmm. the elections are going to be fraudulent that the system is rigged in our case it's not the mailing votes is the electronic voting machines but this has been done uh, by the president and his main allies for the last several months. I mean, they've been uh, sort of sowing doubts among the population. So we already know what he's going to do. What we don't know is how the internet platforms are going to react to this. They saw what this caused in the US. You guys had January 6th and on top of that, you had like, I don't have the most precise figures, but a big proportion of Republicans uh, really believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president. I mean, you're keeping a big chunk of the population in a parallel reality, right? So in Brazil, we're seeing the same thing developing, right? It's like a preemptive, uh, he's preemptively disputing the results just in case he loses the election. It's like he's hedging his bets. And we're all watching. And the platforms are all watching. And they're not doing anything. And on top of all, we have legislation that it's very probably, very probably it's going to be enacted that gives a free pass to politicians to say, guys, I know that in this voting section, there's this guy who's actually a communist and he raped the voting machine. So you should go there and confront him. So can you imagine what's going to happen? <laughs> so, um, and at the same time, we have uh, classic censorship. I mean, Frank uh, is an example. We, I'm also being sued for things that we could never imagine what could be sued in Brazil, for instance, doing stories using our Freedom of Information Act. This is like as factual as it gets. It's like official documents. And I'm being sued for that. Uh, there's also something that is very common also in Hungary, in Turkey, that is allies or rich businessmen linked to the government that are suing. There's this one specific businessman that is suing uh, almost 40 different journalists for really huge sums. And on the other hand, you have this character assassination campaigns, uh, mainly against women journalists. Uh, Many women journalists in Brazil were uh, targeted with such campaigns. Uh, I was one of them. And that includes um, porn deep fake videos. Uh, that includes all sorts of porn memes. And that includes the president himself uh, saying, you know, that a journalist offers sex in exchange for scoops on live TV. So 
I'm not very optimistic, as you might have noticed. But at the same time, I'm, I'm actually, I think there's an opportunity discussing this legis legislation and, and the fact that, you know, you have a, a, a worldwide movement against censorship and against these new forms of censorship. I think it's, it's very, I do have hopes. So sorry to end it on a very optimistic note. And mm -hmm. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. Before we move to Cuenca, just uh, two points about your, what you just said. I think you're right to point out that we are living in the worst of times and the worst of times. So, <laughs> because it's two different worst of times. So, at one side, um, you have these uh, censorship movements that include suing you as a journalist, suing you as a writer. And also very violent communities. Not yet. But also the use of these violent forms of communication and harassment in order to basically disincentivize people to participate in the public sphere. So that's one type of problem. On the other side, you have this maximalist view about freedom of speech as well, exactly. in which uh, you've just described this view in Brazil that is being discussed today that will give basically uh, unlimited immunity if you are a member of Congress or a politician to basically say and do whatever you want online without any sort of scrutiny. And it basically curbs the uh, possibility of uh, social networks or uh, the platforms to basically moderate content, which is something very unique. Because as we know, the platforms they have been acting since 2016 happened and basically they uh, realized that their platforms were being abused and basically these views are trying to curb those efforts and last uh, thing quickly just yesterday there was a decision in a higher court in Brazil uh, precisely by one uh, politician that had his account moderated by one of the platforms because he spread he was spreading fake news so it's not that the um, social network took down they just included an interstice, a sort right. of a, a label in which basically they said that this has been fact checked by France Press and you should look for more information. And then he sued and he sued for two things to remove the label and also because he complained that his uh, posts were not getting as many likes as they used to get before. So that is, that's probably the first time in my life that I heard about the right to virality, like the right to go viral, because one thing is the right of freedom of speech. The other thing is the right to go viral, which by the way, doesn't exist, right? And uh, so that happened yesterday. So at the same time, you have these two things going on, like uh, efforts to curb uh, freedom of speech. And on the other side, this maximalist view that uh, speech cannot be touched even if it's incitement, even if it's discrimination, even if it's uh, against the law. And uh, so we are basically living to different challenges at the same time. So I'm going to hand it to you, but let me just take the presence of Dean Emerita, uh, Mary Geno, she's here with us today. So thank you so much for participating. I look forward to hear your views as well, if possible. So that's great. So uh, João Paulo, please. Well, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Ronaldo, for making this possible for the department, university, and all of you. Uh, I'm not a scholar in the subject. I'm just a writer. So, and I guess the only thing I can do is to just to read uh, a, a diary, an excerpt of a diary that I wrote about my case, because I'm not being persecuted and prosecuted because of my work as a journalist because I'm not a journalist, she is. Mm -hmm. uh, and other journalists in my country were prosecuted by the, the, their real truthful work. I'm being prosecuted because of a satire of a metaphor, a joke. So I'm going to read the joke and then to explain the joke and then to say the consequences of it. It's excerpts of a diary that I wrote between June 2020 and December, okay? So Ronaldo told me I, I had like, I have like five to seven minutes. I guess I use five or seven. <laughs> I'm tiny. <laughs> yeah. Well, June 16, 2020 at 
p.m. during another afternoon of lockdown procrastination, I tweet in brackets, the Brazilian will only be free when the last Bolsonaro is hanged with the entrails of the last priest of the universal church. It's a paraphrase of the saying attributed to Illuminist Voltaire Diderot, but it was originally conceived by French priest Jean Messier. Over the centuries, the saying has been constituted and invented by people across the ideological spectrum. It's a cliche appropriated by anarchists, liberals, anarcho capitalists, environmentalists, people on the left and the right. The original phrasing, as you might know, reads Mankind will only be free when the last king is hanged within trails of the last priest. I give some examples of the use of it. In 15, 2015, leftist Brazilian philosopher Vladimir Safatli published this blade in Folha de São Paulo. The corruption will only end when the last group petista is hanged in the guts of the last group Tuca. <laughs> petista and Tuca are named for Workers' Party and Social Democracy Parties in Brazil. A quick Google search shows that the main ideologue of Bolsonarism, the late Olavo de Carvalho, used the construction of at least twice. Capitalism will only be overcome when the last Marxist is hanged in the guts of the last homo economicus. And that's really absurd. The world will only be happy when the last minister of education is hanged in the guts of the last funkero. Funkero is like funk ball dancer singer. Funk is like the Brazilian Miami bass. Anyway, my favorite is not any of these, but another graffiti in the streets of Paris in May 68. And after strangling the last bureaucrats in the guts of the last socialists, we will still have problems. In my case, Illuminist case saying came to me out of the blue when I was reading an article about the federal government's communication funds, earmarked for radio and TV stations belonging to large evangelical churches. They are the right-wing electoral fortresses. They are driving Brazil over a cliff edge. Outraged by the news, I satirically rewrote the phrase as many others did throughout history. It was impromptu, like many of the throwaway comments that end up on social media, just as someone might doodle on a restaurant napkin. But this time, the napkin reacted furiously. <laughs> I leave the computer to have some coffee. And when I returned to Twitter, I met with hundreds of enraged followers of the president. Next hours, they invade my other inboxes with more insults and death threats. These attacks are coming from boats, human beings, and some missing links somewhere in between. I explained the quote in a thread, and I delete the original tweet. If, it's as if I have open a cesspit beneath me, directly connected to one of the hate's rivers, or to the sewage system of the entire country. I block the accounts to save myself from drowning in the slurry of zombie sheep. Before going to bed, I take a screenshot of the death threats I received during the day, they're not the first one that I've received in my life and I might just be getting used to them. June 18, Thursday. Do you really tweet that? My editor asked me. <clears throat> I write a fortnight op-ed for the Brazilian branch of the German network Deutsche Welle. My last columns were all about critics on Bolsonarism and the dreadful state of things in Brazil. Given the, the implications, I quickly suggest explaining my satire of a 300 year old metaphor in a note on the website or in my next article. She nevertheless rejects the proposal and fires me. Half an hour later, Deutsche Welle published a press statement just fine my second. They say that the outlet is opposed to any hate speech. In fact, I'm sure the German editors and the Brazilian politicians understand the metaphor and the original Illuminist formulation perfectly well. The church and nobility and their ilk must be removed from Republican power for the good of the people. I never said people should be hanged. And believing the opposite is simply disregard figurative language or any capacity for abstraction. Deutsche Welle reaction is a success, result of a well-oiled social technology consolidated with Bolsonarism. The main instrument of it is what we call in Brazil hate offices, gabinetes do ódio, where legislative assistance works in online blitzkrieg against the so-called enemies of this government frequently in smear campaigns, and Patricia is a victim of many of them. They detect the targets very quickly, most using bots online, and go promptly on the attack. This is a relatively effect, effective and cheap mechanism of psychological coercion and censorship, designated to intimidate and silence critical voices. And the same Brazilian neo-fascism had the complicity of a German public company, Deutsche Welle. 
One of the president's sons, Eduardo Bolsonaro, highlights the company decision on social media. He's, he adds, there are still hopes. There are still hope in some parts of the media and threatens me with a lawsuit. The new fashion legislator and our henchmen celebrate publicly and the trauma on my profile, which two days after the tweet had died down, explodes again. And I, all the support I got at this moment were really like uh, the, the reaction that my fellow writers and they were really scared because any, any support was faced with like cursing and threats. Uh, I guess I will jump to the to the part I'm, I'm getting really prosecuted, right? <laughs> because the thing is, uh, no, I'm with June 9, Monday. Today, during the government weekly press conference, a journalist asked Chancellor Angela Merkel, spokesman, if my second had political motivation. Visibly uncomfortable, the spokesman said that he couldn't comment on the matter at this juncture. Colleagues and ex-colleagues at Deutsche Welle have written to me from Germany to show solidarity and informing me privately that my dismissal occurred by direct order of the German foreign ministry pressured by the Brazilian government via the embassy in Brazil. I spend my days in communication <coughs> with the acquaintances of the Brazilian diplomatic service. They say that the system of administration is proficient in communicating internally using parallel and under the radar experiments. More than one of them comment that in order to keep the posts in government, diplomats must offer proof of loyalty. Perhaps my head was one of them. September 22nd. Occasionally I remember the threats and warnings that the Universal Church supporters sent to my inbox, promising to sue me. I Google my full name. I discover within minutes that eight evangelic priests from different states are suing me for defamation. And I got really scared when I was just eight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there's another day, like a week after, four days after, I wake up to the following message of, from one of the lawyers I made contact with. I swept all the country's courts and found 77 proceedings against you. All of them is small claims courts, and all of them a variation within the same parameters you already know. Although the search was in focus on mapping the proceedings. I found at least two internal measures on the Rio de Janeiro ordering you to delete your Twitter account and a rejection of similar interim measure in the state of Acre. The proceeding has spread out across at least 19 states in all the country's regions from Acre to Dort to Rio Grande do Sul in the south. The action is clearly coordinated. Then I'll finish, I read the last paragraph. Uh, the Universal Church is a billion dollar organization with branches in practically every municipality of the country, weaponizing the Brazilian justice system against me. So not only is it possible to defend myself, I don't even think it would be enough to do so. They can simply come up with another hundred lawsuits the next day. So avoid repeating this experience for the people, the goal would be to transform this case into a condemnation of judicial harassment. Lawfare is the abuse of illegitimate use of the law to persecute and destroy someone. This type of bad faith mass litigation has been used not only to civil criticism in Brazil, but also to sow fear by creating a constant threat against freedom of expression. And then some months ago, if I get to the final, I guess, for now, 142 lawsuits amounted to a total of 2.5 million reais uh, because of of my tweets. That's it. Sorry if I took so long, but it's the way to. Thank so you sorry. so much. Thank you so much, uh, João Paulo. I'm sure people will have a lot of questions, especially how you're dealing with your lawsuits uh, right now. But thank you so much for sharing your uh, perspective. Let me change gears and like uh, invite like a martini to basically deliver your yeah. uh, talk, and then let's open the conversation. Like I think people will be. Happy to, uh, you know, uh, dig deeper in what's going on. So please. Yeah. So first, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not in suit, and uh, I can be. Yeah. But uh, but uh, and I have a limited uh, experience on working in the public sector. But uh, my background is technology, and I like to to understand how things works work. And of course, we have those agent, agents that are more that are influencing more. They ask. The, the, the last like said we are talking today, but there's the masses. How masses 
are moving around this information and fake news in most subjects. And that's that, that's something that, that they're going to share. Uh, the first the first the first thing that, that, that they're going to share is is what happen, ha happens with technology and uh, especially processing power. So we generate progress when we increase processing power and we decrease the time we need to exchange information. This is how progress works. We are in a scientific building here and when we share more, we go faster. So that's, that's the same thing that happens with technology. This is what, 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 what we're doing technology. We try to have more processing power to process more information faster and go faster. So, and, and what happens is when we have more processing power, we tend to increase connectivity because it affects the both variables. So we have more, uh, more uh, information and at the same time, we can process information faster. The second thing is uh, when we increase connectivity, uh, with more connectivity, we have more nodes in the network and more sources are producing, sharing, and at the same time, processing information. And, 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 and those things are not just machines, they're people. People are producing, share, and processing information. And uh, when we have a new node in the network, the network, uh, this, this, this power increase exponentially because when we have one more people in the network, there's so much more possibilities of connections. So there's much more sources to share and process and produce information. This is the second aspect. The third aspect, which is very important, is time. We can produce, share, and process more as a network, but as an individual, it does not happen the same way. We still have the same time to, per to perform those actions. As a network, we have more time right now because we are sharing time. So mm -hmm. it's one on top of the other. But as individual, we still have 24 hours a day. Uh, the exponential growth in processing power that the machines had did not biologically reflect our ability to process information as an individual. For sure, impacted, especially in the last two decades. But uh, but 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 not have the same 10x, 100x, 1,000x uh, increase. We still have the same 24 hours of data process information, but now we are trying to process, at the same time, much more information we processed before. When you look the way that we use social media, for example, this is just a graph that happened, that is happening in the United States. In Brazil, it's even bigger. So we are, we are having much more, we are spending much more time uh, consuming information. And this is a, another important aspect. The other aspect is the stages of critical thinking. There are many theories about how critical thinking happens, happens in our minds. But let us use, use uh, Bloom's ta uh, taxonomy of critical thinking as one perspective. In the past, we had less information to perform, uh, to, to perform each day. We use it to intuitively go through those stages for each piece of information to understand if we will accept that information as valid, relevant, truthful, etc. To increase the amount of information we have or want to process each day, or we are very selective, keeping less information to process every day uh, to keep a consistent critical thinking process, or one, we start to go through each stage faster. So we have states to decide if this information is relevant or not for us, if it's true or not, or if it makes sense or not. So we have to go through this stage faster or we simplify the process. So we don't go through all these stages anymore. And to decide if it makes sense or not, if it's true or not, if it's relevant or not, uh, without going to all these stages of critical thinking, thinking that we use it to do it before. In each one of the options, we are creating a possible decrease in the quality of the information processing, less time process, or fewer stages, few, fewer stages to validate. Our brain does this, and it's hard to go against it. We are created by nature; it's human. 
this is just uh, the graph on how the the, the close tax, uh, taxonomy of critical thinking works. So there's some stages that you go through to decide information, you know, just to pre-decide information to decide if it makes sense or not. So what happens? More sources produce, share, and process the information as a network. The network is exponentially growing and is still growing. We just have uh, a little more than the half of the population uh, uh, in, the, in the world today, and the network is still growing. Individually, individually, we have the same amount of time to perform all the tasks. The time is a fixed variable. We have less quality validation. So individually processing more information at the same or less time affects the critical thinking process. Uh, it generates, uh, uh, there's increased risks on the quality of the output of the critical thinking process, generating less trust of information we just process. process. Less trust equals bigger distrust or whatever we want to call it. So for me, the concept of what we call fake news, because it's a concept too, because there's no right or wrong or true or false or whatever, but the concept, it will increase because the way you are structuring the world today based on technology and how the networks works. But the one good aspect of that, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a good aspect, but uh, in a way it is, is that the trust is becoming scarce because of that. But it values increases. So because it's about becoming scarce, so the value of trust increases. We are talking a lot about the new internet and everything. So, mm -hmm. and that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. That's what I brought to collaboration. Thank you, Martin, for framing it uh, from that perspective. And I think we had like uh, some very different perspectives, and that was the idea. And let me open uh, for contributions, questions, and uh, see how we can address the many challenges we have in front of us. So, please go ahead. Have any questions now? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just going to start it to laugh about it because I believe that, you know, first of all, the experiences that you both have are really very painful to hear. Thank you for sharing it with us. Can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, how you feel are your allies? Uh, uh, very isolating experience, and as you said, that combination. Really make you want to do something else in life. Uh, so, uh, how do you keep uh, who your allies with? You keep the most of these international communities mobilized. But uh, where are your efforts? Well, in Brazil, the, the, the writers and, and journalists, they sign a sort of a manifest with support. In Germany, they sign a manifest also. Uh, the Brazilian Press Association um, uh, published a note, the Pan International published a note in my favor. Um, and at, in the end, Media Defense, which is a, a British NGO, they are supporting my defense because it's something that the public the public defense system in Brazil said to me explicitly, it's impossible to do it because I had to have a small, like, like a, a, an office of, of lawyers just to, to track 143 cases. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a film about this, uh, provoke some sort of dialogue, and open society supporting me as well with this project. So it's, uh, it was very important for me to, to, to have this, this support. And the, the, especially in Brazil, the support of the Brazilian Press Association is having like a, a, a strong consequence because, because of this, they enter with the request of an investigation against the church for, for the sort of litigation, which is an abuse of the lawfare, it's abuse of the system. And then the, the, the church now is having to defend uh, itself uh, in a federal court. And they are really upset about this. Mm -hmm. but, wouldn't be possible without the support of this association. 
which is uh, all of these uh, are criminal cases or uh, civil cases? Yeah, they try to do criminal uh, in federal and in the, in the state. Uh, the, 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 all the, the, the judges, they denied it. But the 143, they are only civil courts, small civil courts in Brazil called JEC, Juizado Especial Civil. And it's free and it's a, it's a sort of just sense of you have to defend yourself when they are prosecuting you. That's the thing. They are prosecuting me in very, very far places in our own Brazil. Uh, just addressing your question, I think it's an excellent question. Um, I think the main thing, uh, in my case, women and uh, public opinion, uh, when everything started, I mean, I, I had been working on this, having elections in the US and in India and writing about uh, you know the use of social media. But when I first started um, having this in Brazil, and the sort of the attack started. At first, they were more of a physical kind, you know, like people calling my cell phone and sending threats against my son and all that stuff. And the fake news, like okay, pictures of me and the president saying that I had done something at which I had not or something. And at that time, when I approached the platforms, they were entirely dismissive. They're like, you know, freedom of speech. There's nothing I can do. And even the, like our investigation about uh, one of the things was the mass messaging through WhatsApp. So they said, no, that doesn't exist. Everything is organic. There's no automation. So after a while, the pressure on the platforms, this was, we have to remember, after 2016 in the US, after Brexit, then came lynchings in India in 2018, then the Brazilian elections, then the opinion uh, the public opinion started to put a lot of pressure on the platforms. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. WhatsApp started suing the agencies that were doing the mass messages, uh, which did not exist because everything was organic. Uh, Facebook started responding much more. They're not there yet, but I mean, every time when the second wave of attacks came, which were more of a sexual nature, and it was like by the president himself, by the president's son, they all said those things in public. Uh, there was a huge uh, wave of uh, public support, which in turn puts pressure on the internet platforms because I, I think that's the only way they can do anything. And I think that's the only reason they are trying to moderate, uh, you know, speech that glorifies violence or, uh, is against uh, civic integrity. Uh, the only thing we have on our side is the pressure, the, the fact that this became a PR disaster for the internet platforms. Otherwise they would not have moved at all. Uh, and then if you think of it, oh, okay, so maybe the government, which government? Like the government in the Philippines, the government in Brazil, who's gonna have journalists, right? Um, so I guess uh, the people and the and the women mainly are the ones that are actually on our side. I have a unrelated question to that. Yes. So do you have any financial support to to pay for the holders and legal costs? And and another is, do you find anyone in the federal prosecutor's office or in the federal police there is interest? In this, mm. um, I am a privileged person because I have a, a job and a job that provides legal assistance. If I lose my job, I don't, right? So I need to keep this job. Um, <laughs> as of now, as of now, I have legal assistance, so they are defending me. There was a case that was Bolsonaro himself suing me. Uh, that that one we lost. Now there's this one in for two million. Guys, which is like an amount of money I've never seen in my life. And then there's like all those absurd cases regarding Freedom of Information Act, which is, I mean, to be sued for a story you did using freedom of our lay justice information, it's just unthinkable. I mean, it's just like you can sue the, anyone for anything if you can sue someone using, you know, factual stuff from a spreadsheet from the government, right? 
so the, the newspapers, and, and they are also helping me with the cases that I am suing the president and I am suing his son for uh, slander, basically. Uh, but this is not, I mean, like Cuenca, there's so many other uh, freelance or writers or freelance journalists, they don't, and this, what is the effect of this? It's censorship. Who's going to investigate uh, the government if you're going to be subject to judicial harassment? And you're a freelance and you don't have any lawyers. Uh, unless you have the media defense fund or you know, someone helping you, it's just really uh, you know, insecure. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it creates a, an environment of fear because you don't, you don't, you don't want to get prosecuted by saying, because in my case, I made a joke, right? But these people are, are writing real stories with real data. Uvira Lobato, she was, uh, I was gonna mention. before my case was the most, most famous case of the church. They, she got prosecuted by 111 uh, uh, pastors just for writing factual data, you know, that because the, the purpose is not uh, what you said, it's to create an example and to create a stage of fear. Uh, if it wasn't for me to the first, I, I really, I, I couldn't sleep for six months <laughs> because I, I, I was a freelance and Dr. Chavelle did what they did to me. So, <laughs> but the only hope I guess it's if we change legislation, there's a, 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 pro, a law project in Brazil right now uh, in the Congress. The, it passed by the CCJ, you say this in English. The Commission of Constitutionality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Judiciary Committee. It's one of the commissions yeah. Uh, yeah. in the Congress. Yeah, yeah. So there's hope. Because now there's some the the Brazilian yeah. NGOs as well, protected journalists, like Felipe Neto. And, yeah. Yes, now they, they are like civil society or they're getting together to get funding to defend mm -hmm. writers and journalists and, and people who are being targeted with this kind of. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that's a good point. Civil society in Brazil has always been organized and uh, responsive. The problem is civil society has been overwhelmed yes. with so many different issues that are happening right now. So the, right. the organizations, they exist and they are responsive. The problem is they have so much on their pipelines that it might be hard to be responsive quickly or even to be responsive regarding everything. So I think that that is also uh, a problem that we see uh, going on at the moment, yeah. Just to, I, I think my question about like the, the which, is there any institution in the state who is doing something and it's not, it, it was not supposed to be the further police of the state prosecutors because it's not yeah. directly to, related to that. But I, I wonder, the thing is what happened here, you have a huge organization in the case of the church against the individual and this is their strength. So you really need to like to change the playing field here. And I think one of the directions would be changing the law in the sense that at least the judge, they should be, I don't know, you, you need to have something to say, this strategy doesn't work mm -hmm. and doesn't work not because you have someone supporting you because this is gonna affect you. Is that because you're gonna lose all you know, everything before or whatever, but we need to have an organization. But, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Until now, I mean, as, as we have, as of now, it depends entirely on the judge again. Yeah. Yes. It's just, you know, arbitrary. And there's no, I mean, this, this piece of legislation that is being, that might work for this specific thing of suing in different places, but not for all the rest. Yeah. Well, not for like this one businessman suing 38 journalists uh, for Brazilian knowledge. Yes, but I wonder whether there is no strategy with, for instance, the national Brazilian National Justice. Uh, I don't know. I, I know they are terrible to work with, but like these, they are the only institution I can think. And they published a recommendation about my case like three weeks ago. Saying that, yeah, yeah. Saying that uh, we must take care of this sort of uh, institution. <laughs> Repetitive litigation cases. They started to make some some uh, jurisprudence about this, but as, as she said, it's just because just for the Jack's case, there's another whole. Mm -hmm.
or take something to the Supreme Court to get the jurisprudence in. Yes, yeah, I, I think. Until like he that. gets yeah. reelected and gets to appoint two other justices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it's but, but I think your case might become a leading case in Brazil uh, for a coordinated uh mm -hmm. action uh and basically if there is a decision that addresses that specifically yeah. that it's can be very helpful yeah so th th there are some uh reasons for uh optimism in that sense because your case had a very high profile in brazil so it was in all the papers and uh widely debated in the public sphere uh there was a movement an institutional movement as you described the the National Council of Justice, which is a constitutional body in Brazil, is also moving. And I think uh, the higher courts, judges, they're taking a notice about what's going on because th these cases, they, they can be uh, an abuse, which is very clear of uh, the right to sue, which in Brazil is uh, pretty broad. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that is a, a positive uh, feature of the Brazilian legal system, which is the fact that you can go to a court, like a small court claim, like, like the ones that they use against you, and you, you don't need a lawyer. You can sue without a lawyer or paying any legal fees. So if this system is abused for that sake, uh, that goes totally in opposition of why it was created in the first place. So your case, I think it has a, a very important possibility of becoming a leading case against this type of practice. Elvira Lobato was one of the greatest journalists in Brazil, investigative journalists. After what happened to her, she had to spend a year going to each court. Yes. Like she basically gave up journalism. She, she did. That, that, that. I mean, she did work a bit, right? Yeah. But it, no, she was, she it, made, it made of that. it impossible. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's she left journalism because of that. Yeah. Traumatized. Yeah, and if I understand it correctly, in your film, which is going to be a documentary, you'll be traveling to the cities to meet the people that I will try. Them. I don't yeah. know if I, I, they will want to talk to me, yeah. but I, I guess the whole thing is going there. Yeah. Because there are some cities that you have to take a plane, uh, mm -hmm. 10 hours in a car, and then get a boat, and then a small village. It's really this place yeah. with f five streets and three churches. And yeah. Small yeah, villages. The, the board, the, the, the Bar Association had some reaction about yeah. this case. Which association? Oh, the, the Bar Association. The Bar Association. The the uh, you know, uh, I contacted them, uh, but they they decided not to. That's yeah, strange, huh? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. But yeah. you contact the federal or the the, the federal because uh, I have a contact there, and they were trying to because. The, the OAB, they really all the time they're like publishing notes about mm -hmm. pretty much everything in but in my case they remain in silence mm -hmm. yeah no. weird yeah, yeah. I, yes please uh, could you talk a little bit about the fake news bill and yes. the impact it will have on the, the elections i know it's open-ended but <laughs> this is what keeps us up at night yes <laughs> this brilliant legislation maybe you want to start uh, i'll just give you some features of the bill so initially it was a fake news bill uh and then it turned into a sort of a debate and every different stakeholder trying to get it to a different side so here's a couple of things that it does uh, it mandates that internet companies have a representative in brazil which i think is positive we've been facing a lot of problems with uh telegram uh which is basically ignoring the courts everywhere not only in brazil but germany and other countries and this bill would make that uh, stance a little bit more difficult but as we were talking in the beginning it also creates immunity for politicians to basically do whatever they want online without any sort of moderation so it curbs the platforms from doing moderation of content which I'm, I'm not so sure how that's going to help with uh, fighting fake news. Uh, it also creates uh, one specific authority in Brazil, which is the Brazilian Steering Committee, uh, and grants a few powers of supervision to that committee in terms of uh, working with the platforms. And it creates a lot of transparency 
uh, requirements in regards to uh, the platforms themselves as well. And uh, it creates a sort of a, some procedural rules in how do you remove content or not. So in the end, it became sort of a, a mixed deal, you know? And I think it's anyone guess, anyone's guess, like a, What's how it's effective? going to be actually implemented and how effective it's going to be. Yeah. There's stuff that is actually important, like they, they are trying to emulate the Australian deal yeah. to pay for news content. Oh yeah, that's important. Which yeah. is in it of itself, it's, it's good. But it's not an ideal. I mean, they have not reached, not even in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, a good way to do that. But that's, I, I think that I was discussing this this morning. I think it's the only way journalism can survive is if you can sort of balance the, the level playing field uh, platforms and, and media outlets. I'm not sure if that's the best way because that yeah. might have wrong incentives and you might end up paying for small disinformation bloggers or mm -hmm. websites and stuff but this is something important but the immunity part i think that's they had to do this they had to include this uh to appease uh, the bolsonaristas right. yes and yeah, to get it to be approved mm -hmm. uh and the other thing that is interesting is there's this other thing that basically article Two, it says that um, internet platforms are going to be uh, viewed as uh, media outlets for the purposes of a specific electoral law. The fact that platforms are just going crazy about this because it's basically overturning our Section 230 of the Communication uh, Decency Communications Act. That, that is our Marcus view, sort of. Uh, they said it's just for this specific legislation because basically there was a decision by the Supreme Court last year saying that if you abuse the use of social media, be it Facebook or, or WhatsApp, uh, you can be, uh, your candidacy can be annulled, Casa uh, Chapa. Yes. So this was, it's what he said, each article, someone put it there. We have a saying in Brazil that if the turtle is on the tree, there's a reason for that. Uh, and this legislation is like you can identify who put, like Global put the one for paying for news content. This one was Alexandre de Moraes, the Supreme Court Justice, because he wants to enforce it in terms of electoral legislation. Then you have the internet platforms aggressively lobbying against the legislation. No, basically, they are buying like Two page ads in newspapers saying this is gonna destroy small businesses because they won't be able to pay for. I mean, it's just it's crazy the amount of money they're spending lobbying. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because it's happening the, the debate in Congress right now as we speak right yes. now. We might even have someone on Zoom watching us uh, and taking note of what we are discussing here. But uh, interestingly, it gathered a lot of political momentum. So it's it's likely it's going to be passed. For some time, I, I thought it wouldn't happen, but I think now it's becoming more likely uh, to be approved because, as you mentioned, different stakeholders will feel happy about it. So the politicians, there will be a special class of citizen in Brazil with a sort of a free uh, pass to do whatever they want online without any repercussions. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. So actually, I, I'm worried about uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that we have like basically three minutes to conclude. And I would like to use those minutes to give you like a, one final remark so that we can adjourn. I know that some people have classes and we have to uh, finish also the Zoom broadcast. But Martini, let's hear from you, please. Uh, I think from for me, the, the whole context changed a lot in the last, you know, especially in the last two decades. Yeah. And uh, it's very hard to use the same weapons that are used to, used to yeah. fight against that. Uh, look where we are going right now. Uh, technology and everything, how people are evoking on the like, discussion. So I, I really believe that we need to be very disruptive on the way to solve those questions because we are using the same and the traditional uh, system to fight against new systems. So I don't think that's possible. Uh, that's it. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm not going to sleep very well tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thank you so much. And Patrice, please. I spoke too much. No, I spoke too much. Yes, no, I don't appreciate it. You like it? No, really. One minute. Well, I don't know. I'm just praying this legislation is not as bad as it looks. That's great. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> I make the words my words, and and it's funny because I guess the the right now the solution we have is legislation, yeah. but the right ones, you know. Yeah. The the hope for cases like mine, and I'm not the only a writer journalist being prosecuted using this sort of small civil yeah. courts in Brazil. Yeah. It's a law. It's just, that's it. Yeah. The, NGOs are they 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 can do a, a nice work, but it's only like. Um, so the, it, the amount of it is it's just a law. Yeah. It's the, yeah. the right law. Yeah, and I think that's a great wrap up because it brings together yeah. your two points and also yours because if you think about these problems, there are some people that think that technology is the solution, right? So let's build a better platform or let's build uh, ways that we can protect people's privacies or cybersecurity or even like uh, their freedom of speech using technology. But maybe the best technology we have is a millenary technology of the law, because that's where the power of uh, societies and especially democratic societies come together. So I tend to agree with you. I think the territory in which these disputes are going to advance, not sure if they are going to be fully solved, but at least advance a little bit in terms of safe harbors and how we can uh, go forward is precisely the territory of the law. So I'm happy that Brazil is having this discussion in mm -hmm. Congress. And maybe this view will be effective, better, or at least yeah. put us in a better uh, place than we yes. were before. Or maybe not. So uh, we'll, <laughs> we really don't know. I'm sorry to end it with this question mark here. But let me thank you all for joining the conversations today. We really appreciate it. And thanks to our panelists for sharing with us. So thank you very much. Bye -bye. Obrigado. 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 Obrigado.